before COVID, what annual world savings were? There was seven trillion dollars a year. That's every year. Okay, increment. And after COVID, obviously, it's gone up because consumption has fallen. So if you look at it as finance, qua finance, there is plenty of money in the world for everything we want to do. There is no absolute shortage of finance, which means that providing finance for uh, activities that would secure a just transition would in some way be inhibited by the total volume of savings at a macroeconomic level. Okay? So then what's the problem? It gets even more curious when you see that the majority of finance that you would require, whether public or private, let's take private, uh, is needed in emerging economies, not in poor developing countries, actually, in emerging economies, the vast majority of it. Emerging economies offer rates of return on financial capital, which are at least three or four times the rates of return on capital that you get in the OECD countries, the rich countries. Logically, by the rules of economics, therefore, finance should be flowing from OECD countries to emerging economies. It's not. So the simple rules of supply and demand do not apply in the case of climate finance, and we have to ask why. In fact, the simple rules of, climate, of, of supply and demand do not apply in the case of development finance. If you invest in a country's growth just by putting in a growth bond, forget climate, and you expect that country to grow at 8 or 9%, you would expect a return of 8 or 9%. Why would you not put that money there? We have to ask ourselves this question. And that question, I think, in the climate and finance space or the sustainability space was answered very eloquently, but ignored by the entire climate community since at least Kyoto. I'm old enough to remember something called the Brundtland Report. If you think about the premise on which we looked at a sustainable future in the Brundtland Report, what it said was two things. It said the world has never produced so much. But still, there remain huge shortfalls in consumption of some sections of the world. And at the same time, the commons, resources that we hold in common, in trust, not private resources, not state resources, are being eroded by this overproduction, which is not even satisfying the minimum consumption needs of a large section of the population whether it's health, clean water, sanitation, et cetera. In addition to not satisfying these, you're not destroying their air, right? You're polluting their built environment. Therefore, what you need to do is to change the patterns of production and consumption. And that indeed is one of the SDGs. Good. That sounds great to me. But then if I look at the discussions in the COPs, what are we talking about in the COPs? We're not talking about changes in the pattern of production and consumption. We are talking about net zero, right? Net zero is an arithmetic result, which can happen in many ways. As India tried to say in the COP before they were shooed and then people insisted on net zero target. Frankly, very silly climate warriors insisted on net zero target. Very silly of them. Very naive. That's the curse of the left liberal, I suppose. Uh, India said, fine, we'll give you a target, 2017, now please give me a loan. But what India was saying earlier was, let's talk about pathways. Well, I can achieve net zero by halving developed country consumption and that would, that would halve waste and halve my problem. Right? I could. Koisha, if I manage to reduce world consumption, I could Meet net zero? Is anyone talking about that? Is anybody talking about that? Has anyone talked about that for the last 20 years? No. We are talking, and that is one. Second is the extraordinarily suspicious for me choice of energy as the unit of account in talking about decarbonization. You see, energy has two characteristics. It's an intermediate good. So as far as a decarbonization advocate is concerned, a carbon warrior, they don't care whether a unit of energy is used by someone sitting in, you know, in, in England, like I am, if I took off this sweater and shirt sleeves, all I need to do is double the heater, consume three times the amount of energy. The heating is available. Well, if it's being done through solar and goody goody technologies, then I don't care. I only don't use coal. But what about the child in India who needs that energy in a light bulb to study? As long as both energies come from the same source, renewable, clean, green, the climate warrior does not care. 
And therefore, the entire debate on the energy transition has been about technologies that will help people make money to produce energy, to maintain the current production and consumption lifestyles exactly as they are. And uh, the previous speaker's comments on incinerators, by the way, I will take that up with climate bonds and a senior advisor to them, makes that point for me very eloquently. You do not want to change the unequal ways in which some people, some countries, some geographies, and this is not about rich and poor, North and South. North and South is a lot of bullshit in some ways. Rich people in poor countries, like mine, are as guilty of this, of buying into this argument as rich countries as a whole. Okay? So in those circumstances, let me give you three facts about this great energy transition. There will be plenty of finance for the following things. For green hydrogen, for electric cars, and so on and so forth. There'll be very little finance for the following things. Waste management, built environment, green agriculture, which would enable people to change their patterns of production and consumption, as the previous speaker was saying, move towards a more decentralized and therefore a low consumption footprint, uh, therefore net zero friendly uh, way of conducting our lives. But that is not on offer in the COP. What is on offer in the COP is that some people got to make some money. And those people, whether it is Adani or Ambani in India, or British Petroleum or Elon Musk in the West, are going to make money off the green transition, whether you like it or not. And then, as we have seen in any development transition, we will say that let's throw some crumbs at the poor people. Let's do some green justice. Let those poor coal miners we're not talking about just coal miners here. We're talking about a large number of people who live in extremely degraded circumstances. And if you're saying that the climate transition is indifferent to that, then it is in direct conflict with my aspirations for financing a development transition and your aspirations for financing a climate transition. And if you're going to tell me that your financing objectives take priority, I'm not going to listen to you. And I think this is very much what Prime Minister Modi did in the COP. The number of one trillion, it doesn't matter. I just told you it's $7 trillion a year available potentially. I think the point he was making is whether it is public or private finance, whether it is done cooperatively or otherwise, show me your capability of mobilizing it in ways where the bulk of the mobilization does not happen because of the clout of Mr. Ambadi, Mr. Adani, Mr. Elon Musk, British Petroleum. So if you ask yourself, who are going to be the climate millionaires in 2030? The answer is going to be largely the same people who were fossil fuel millionaires in 2010. That is the real financing story. That's a story about finance. Uh, those who are able to mobilize finance to make money by investing in areas where the pathway to energy transition, to net zero that you choose is one that does not affect existing production consumption patterns are going to be the ones who will get that finance. They will get it preferentially. They will get it in spades. And the rest of the world will have to do with the crumbs of a green climate fund, which cannot even mobilize $100 billion uh, you know, to sort of save the planet and run away and worry about sort of adapting to climate change where there's also money to be made. There are a few ways out of this. And one, of course, which is why I support climate bonds, is to shift the focus from what are the things you're investing in. So my main challenge here is I need to get finance out of energy fast. I need to get volume increases in finance in areas like solid-based management, in areas like agriculture, in areas like uh, built environment. The trouble with doing that, you see, is that these financial flows are not amenable to corporatization for some of the reasons the previous speaker mentioned in the same way as energy is or cars is or Elon Musk is. You know, Elon Musk's ability to run a great green industry and then go off into space is contingent upon an extremely inequitable model of transportation becoming green, which is the automobile. I cannot really do that 
in the many areas. In some areas with public ownership, I can, like the railways and the climate policy are useful to there. But in the other areas, I have to find decentralized ways of doing greener agriculture, doing better solid waste management, doing better built environment that are not amenable to the way the world of finance is structured. Therefore, one of the financial products that can help you get around this without a change in the political economy is bonds. Because bonds are independent of banks. Bonds do not require collateral. Therefore, in principle, it is possible to promote financial products as long as there is a tenable business plan, however decentralized, that will enable that funding to go into the areas that I want. Bonds can also be retail packaged downwards. And bonds, because they are fixed income product, provide a short stream of return going forward. Now, the trouble with bonds is that immediately what the financial sector has been saying is where is the green yield? Where do I see that green bonds will pay me at least as much or more than my current vanilla investments? That problem can be solved, except it I note with great regret that that problem was not even mentioned except en passant. At this COP, it will not be mentioned in Egypt, etc., because people don't want to know. When green bonds are sovereign bonds, then people are quite happy because that allows that green bond to be spent in way that governments wish to spend them. But governments show a marked reluctance, I know this as someone who has worked with governments, to invest in decentralized projects. Because sovereign bonds are guaranteed the sovereign level, the sovereign has more control and fiduciary control when things are centralized. Whereas the very nature of the sustainable pathway zero, um, net, net zero emission uh, kind of transformation that I want to see that is just and equitable in areas like agriculture, I keep repeating them, the built environment, waste, you know, these are decentralized in nature and they therefore involve the government's ability to give up coercive power to lower levels, which runs counter to most government's political instincts. So that is one challenge we have with, with green bonds. And therefore, you know, all this talk about municipal bonds is only so much talk. Mobilization at scale either happens with big companies big corporates, and that's good. But I don't see much of it coming into areas other than railways. I see, again, going into energy. Or at the sovereign level, but that sovereign product, getting it down to decentralized uh, places is difficult. Second is, there is no systematic effort in energy put in by national planning authorities or indeed by the private sector. NGOs do it, but that's not enough. That is not seeping into producing what I would call 10,000 different bankable business plans, 10,000 financeable business plans for which I can then create a financial product or service for the built environment, for energy. And this is particularly remarkable in a country like mine in India, which, you know, despite its many faults, does not lack engineering and financial talent. We have plenty of chartered accountants. We have plenty of finance professionals, many of whom uh, could be put to this uh, exercise of creating, for example, 300 decentralized, uh, socially just, uh, non-energy, net zero transitions across the country. And those business plans could then feed up with national support to an ask which the financial markets could then respond to. I can do it. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's not easy, but it's not rocket science. Uh, it has been done at least three or four times before in the history of the world. It is regularly done during war time. Uh, it is frequently done when you, in, 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 in countries that have been successful investing in human capital. Uh, I don't have time, but let me refer you just to the French uh, universalization of education in the 19th century, the crowdsourcing of the Suez Canal, the new Suez Canal by Egypt, right? Uh, attempts across countless communities uh, across the United States, well, the more progressive parts of the United States, to try and take control of and improve the quality and effectiveness of solid waste management and ecosystem services. There are many examples. But that, that range of effort is not there and is not invested in, in three ways. It is not invested in, in terms of capacity because it is not spoken of at the COP. It is not invested in, in terms of emotional energy because the energy is lacking at the COP. It is not invested in by the world of finance because the product is not there and the channels to product are not there. And then finally, 
there is the fourth constraint, which is a genuine north-south constraint, which is that this sort of change would require countries in the north to see the long-term benefits of collective action to get this kind of net zero pathway, not to the climate, but to global peace and security. Very important, right? And to the viability of the global economic system as a whole, and they're not seeing it. How can I expect them to see it? They don't even see it in the case of vaccines. They're hoarding vaccines. You seriously expect such governments to be farsighted enough to see that, you know, governments that can't see that hoarding vaccines is not in their interest and are now suffering as this country is with Omicron, <laughs> are not hardly going to sort of collectively invest in these matters. Now, my, I have dealt with in this, in this peroration of mine, which I'm going to finish in two minutes, with the big ticket issues, because I actually believe that focusing on, there are very important small ticket issues to focus on in finance, and I'm happy to pick them up in the, in the, in the chat. But the big ticket issue to summarize is, one, there's plenty of finance. So finance is not the binding constraint. It becomes the binding constraint for the reasons I mentioned, which is a unimodal focus on energy because of the transition in the sustainability debate from talking about sustainable production and consumption to talking about net zero and decarbonization. I hate those words. Net zero and decarbonization can come with different models of production and consumption. By focusing on them, you are reifying energy you are not paying attention to uh, the real places where changes in production consumption patterns could give you an appropriate net zero pathway. And I mentioned them repeatedly, so I won't go again. And I will. Agriculture, the built environment, waste management. Okay. Uh, if you look at financial markets, there are a series of problems. Sovereigns are willing to decentralize. These areas, by definition, involve decentralized projects. Uh, there isn't enough product out there because that product involves a lot of work for which initial transactions costs are high. And finally, no one is willing to have these conversations either in terms of intellectual capital or emotional energy at any level from Davos to the cops. Climate bonds, bonds in general, fixed income product offer a good way of unlocking this puzzle, but are still subject to some of the constraints I mentioned. Now, uh, therefore, the picture I think is very bleak. I suspect, therefore, what is going to happen is what I've been repeatedly warning about, which you saw in the debate on phase down and phase out of coal. If countries, if rich people in any geography, I want to emphasize, if rich people in any geography and today's winners continue to treat the climate problem as hostage, they're continuing to win and prosper at the expense of everybody else, then climate is going to become a weapon of the weak. It already has to some extent. You tell a child in, in Rachi or in Jharkhand that your life is going to be destroyed by climate and if his or her response is, my life is destroyed today, then there is every incentive on part of that child or that country or that geography to let the ice cap melt. This is a very dangerous game that I think the rich countries and the rich people in any geography are playing. And since they are about finance, we have to continue to bring this political point to their attention if we are going to unlock this puzzle. No amount of financing from multilateral institutions or multinational institutions has done anything whatsoever for any development goal in the past. I'm responding to Navjot's question. Nothing. It has not reduced poverty. It has not improved governance. It has not helped the environment. Okay? We've had a GEF for 20 years. Nothing happened. We'll have a GCF for another 15 years. Nothing will happen. Finance exists first as savings, and then the channelization of those savings to things that people wish to produce and consume. That work is done, number one, by the private sector, number two, by sovereign governments. Multilateral institutions quibble, you know, at the margins. Uh, India's bond markets are not inefficient and unpopular always. Mr. Dhubai Ambani built his, this Titania, built his empire on bonds. We destroyed our bond markets. There is plenty of scope to encourage climate bonds. What I need is non-energy product, and what I'm not seeing is non-energy product. Uh, I think I've answered the last question. I'll make a final point. There is, which I can take up. There is something else we could do with public finance, which involves a shift from aid 
into something I call global public finance for global public goods. But that again involves changing the lens of the entire climate finance debate ever away from financing an intermediate good to achieve a particular selfish net zero pathway to financing a range of other goods in that would actually change the ecosystem of production and consumption and thereby bring about a net zero transition that would be sustainable and financially viable. Thank you. Mm-hmm.